Hi everyone, this is lecture one for POS 201, Introduction to Political Theory. Um, this is the first substantive lecture that we have for the class, and prior to watching this lecture, you should have all uh, read the piece by Isaiah Berlin, Does Political Theory Still Exist? And uh, also consult the reading questions. The reading questions, it's a challenging piece, um, and so the reading questions kind of help you make sense of it. So what we'll be doing <clears throat> today is um, first we're going to talk about political science, the discipline of political science at U.S. universities, its fields, its structure, uh, how it's set up. And um, that is kind of a lead into the types of questions that we ask in political science versus the types of questions that we ask in political theory. They're a little bit different, and we'll go into how specifically they're different. Uh, we'll talk about the sometimes antagonistic relationship between those fields. And then we move into what Berlin is saying, uh, he makes some arguments about the death of political theory. He talks about something called pluralism and where those fit in relation to the study of political theory. And what he was, you know, he was saying this in 1963, I think, was the, when the piece was written. Um, but it still holds true today. He makes some arguments that are still relevant for political theory today and also uh, contemporary American politics. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So, um, the subfields of political science at American universities, uh, as you know, this class is it's taught within a political science department. So, I am a political scientist, I was trained as a political scientist, and the course is offered through the political science department here at UMaine. Now, <clears throat> in political science in the United States, the way that it's set up, um, and those of you who are political science majors might be familiar with this, you have what's called a subfield. Right. And a subfield, all that means is it's just an area of specialization, and it's where teaching is going to be focused, it's where research is going to be focused. So we take uh, you know, the broad field of po political science, we break it up into uh, subfields, and that's where we concentrate our teaching, and that's where we concentrate our research. So we have these different subfields. There's four primary subfields of political science. Uh, the first is international relations. This is the study of politics above the level of the state. So um, things like foreign policy, things like uh, war, things like global trade, globalization generally. These are the type of things that you would study in an international relations course. If you took an intro to international relations course, that's what you'd be talking about. It's things like international security, international trade, but all of that occurring over and above the level of the state. And you're really looking at the interactions between different states in an in international relations course. Second subfield is comparative politics. <clears throat> comparative politics, you're comparing different national systems of government, different national forms of political organization. Right? So you would perhaps um, compare the United States and Canada and uh, Germany and Russia in terms of their political development and how they um, develop their modern institutions, or um, some dimension of policy, right? Uh, how, do, how do three or four different countries approach um, social welfare policy, for example? So you're dealing less, less with the level of uh, interaction between states, and you're kind of looking at different case studies. You're using the comparative method, hence the title comparative politics. American politics, um, Many of you have probably taken a course in American politics, even if it's just you know the introductory course in American politics. But that's the study of politics within the U.S. specifically. So you could, in in a course like that, you might be looking at um, different institutional elements of American politics. You might look at the presidency and the Congress and the Supreme Court. You might look at uh, American public opinion and how it's evolved over time, how it's changed, how it's. Uh, kind of grown and, and uh, become different over time. So American politics focuses specifically on the United States and political phenomena within the United States. And then you have political theory. Right? And political theory is what I'm going to lay out for you beginning today, <clears throat> and it's what we're going to discuss uh, throughout this course. And political theory is kind of unique. Uh, at some schools, you'll also have a branch called public law, where you focus on law, society, the judicial branch, um, usually within the United States. Um, but at other universities, it's simply subsumed under American politics. 
right? So public law is another subfield you might see. Um, and we actually, we don't set it up that way at the University of Maine. We just have these four subfields. Okay. So, <clears throat> one of the ways that we can think about political science and political theory, and we can get at some of the differences between what political science does and uh, what political theory does, is we can talk about the types of questions that we ask within political science. So if you took a course in international relations or American politics or comparative politics, um, chances are the types of questions that you'd be focused on would be empirical questions. Right? And we can talk about different types of empirical questions. There's really three types of empirical questions. Um, so there are a huge number of questions we could ask ourselves, but we could break it down to the, these three categories. A uh, descriptive question right, is a question which asks you to describe something. Um, so these are questions which ask who and what and when and where. An example would be um, who participates in politics. Right? One of the arguments that's made <clears throat> um, is that we've seen this shift and young people, you know, people between the ages of 18 and 25 or 18 and 30, are participating less in political life than they used to. They become disengaged. And so the youth um, are disenchanted, they are disaffected with politics, and so they don't really engage. But you'd have to ask that question, and you'd have to go out and study it. And you have to look at things like participation rates. Are they voting? Are they active members of their party? Are they making political contributions? Are they engaged in other forms of political activity if you were going to answer that question? Um, but that's the type of question you could ask. Uh, there is a whole field, a whole cottage industry and basically what they ask are descriptive questions. This is public opinion, right? So when you see a public opinion poll that relates to politics, it could be about an upcoming election. It could be about a particular political issue, right? Um, they're asking, by and large, descriptive questions. Who are you going to vote for in uh, the next election? What is, you know, of these five issues, what is the most important to you? Um, things like that. So public opinion is really, primarily what they're doing is asking descriptive questions and trying using a sample, using a subset of the larger population. They're trying to get the most accurate answers that they can. But public opinion, by and large, they're asking descriptive questions. And we encounter that every day, right? Um, particularly during election years, right? We see, um, this focus on descriptive questions. So that's the first type of empirical question that we could ask within political science. Second type is explanatory. And I know I'm, <clears throat> I'm breaking the rules here because when you define uh, when you define a term or when you define a concept, you're not supposed to use the actual term itself in the process of defining it, but I think it's fine for our purposes. Um, so explanatory, it's a question which asks you to explain something, right? Um, so these are going to be a bit more complex. You're asking why, you're asking how. Um, oftentimes you're thinking about the relationship between variables and outcomes or causes and effects. So, um, you know, why did Obama win in the 2012 election? Well, you could generate some hypotheses about why that was, right? Why he was able to, um, to beat Romney and beat Romney pretty handily. Um, and then you would have to go and <clears throat> look at the evidence, collect some data, right, do some research, and you could develop an explanatory account for why that is. You know, it's these three reasons seem to be the most important. It was these three things, or these four things, um, that seem to be the most important. So an example um, along the lines of this theme of participation, we could ask, why do some participate in politics more than others? If we go back to the idea that young people are disaffected and they're not engaging in politics um, as much as they used to or as much as some other parts of the population, we could say, okay, well, why is that? Why is it that young people um, between the ages of 18 to 25, ages of 18 to 30, why are they not participating? And why are some groups participating in politics more than them? Right. So that would be an explanatory question, and those would be examples of explanatory questions. The third type of question is predictive. And <clears throat> these are obviously questions which ask us to predict a future event 
um, who will, what will. Uh, we're trying to kind of gaze into the crystal ball of politics and, and uh, offer some account of what things are going to like and look like in the future. So we could ask who will participate in the 2016 presidential election. Um, one of the really interesting things, if you've been following American politics, there's this growing Latino demographic. And it's estimated, I think the numbers are um, by 2030, that the number of Latino voters is going to double. And um, the Republicans, the Republican Party has had a hard time, at least in national elections, winning the Latino vote, right? Um, and so that would be... Ultimately, you know, if you're thinking about future presidential elections, if you're thinking about 2016 and 2020 and 2024, um, you, you would have to kind of, in order to make any prediction, you have to think about how that growing Latino demographic is going to affect Republicans on the national political stage. And will they be able to, um, you know, kind of make inroads with Latino voters? Or if they don't, how is that going to affect their chances for the future? Um, so that would be a predictive question. We ask predictive questions a lot uh, when we're studying international relations. Um, so, you know, what is going to happen in Syria? There's been this uh, civil war that's been brewing there for, um, you know, over a year now. And uh, what will the eventual outcome of that be? Um, Will our foreign policy with Iran change with a new president? Ultimately, there, you know, if you're saying anything about the future condition of, of those sorts of events, you're making a predictive, um, you're making a prediction, right? You're asking a predictive question. You're providing a prediction that answers it. Uh, an example for, uh, again, along the theme of participation would be who will participate in the 2016 presidential election. So what groups are going to participate in what numbers relative to past outcomes, right? So those are empirical questions. And those are the three types of empirical questions. Those are generally, if you're taking a course within political science, what um, is happening is you're being trained to answer those types of questions. And you're being trained to think in that sort of way, right? So when you watch the news, <clears throat> and you're hearing about political events that are occurring or different political phenomena, you start to think in terms of those questions and how you would begin to answer them. Uh, and that's what training in political science is really all about. Political theory is a little bit different because we don't ask in political theory those types of questions. And I always say to students, and this kind of surprises them, but I always say um, whether you know it or not, Right? Whether you knew what political theory was before you took this course or not, uh, you're a political theorist at some level. And the reason is because political theory revolves around normative questions. Okay? And normative questions are questions which ask us to judge political phenomena. So if you have looked at political events in the world and you have asked yourself what ought to be, so what is right? what is just, what is the good political action in a given situation, then you've engaged in political theory. That is the realm in which political theory deals. And um, you have probably, at some point in your life, you have asked a normative question about politics. And this is the activity that we associate with political theory. So these are normative questions. The, the key thing to remember about normative questions is that they're asking us to judge political phenomena, and they usually include the word should or ought, right? So again, if we go back to that theme of participation, right, um, a question that we could ask, which would be a normative question, would be should more people participate in politics, and why should they? And that's a different type of question, right? That's a more... Um, abstract, a more philosophical question, and ultimately involves judgment. It's not simply about measuring how many people participate, or it's not about predicting what the effects of people's participation will be, but you're making a, an ethical kind of normative argument about what is valuable about politics and why people should, should, should participate. Okay. Um, so these are questions which ask us to judge something, and um, those are some examples of the types of normative questions you could ask. Now, that's not to say that political theory ignores the empirical world. So it doesn't ignore facts, right, what we would call facts. But it focuses more, it kind of zeroes in on that normative aspect, that aspect of judgment, 
And so for that reason, we tend to say that it deals more in the realm of values. Right? And we make this distinction between facts and values. Uh, in American politics today, there are the facts and then there are values. We hold certain values. And those are very different things. And the goal of political theory, real, political theory really is to initiate new ways of thinking about and evaluating and judging. Again, the central concept of judgment, judging the political realm, right? So judging the politics that we all see. Um, it tends to be more concerned with concepts. Uh, so, you know, concepts like justice or freedom or citizenship or political obligation or participation or identity or democracy, right? These are all concepts. Um, tends to be more concerned with those things than data or evidence or, you know, what's actually happening in the world. But again, it explores those concepts in terms of what should be. So this is the ideal. So we talk about, you know, what is the ideal form of justice? What is the ideal form of freedom? What would democracy look like if it were reaching the ideal? Or what would democratic citizenship look like if it were actually reaching that ideal? So that's very different. Right? And for, for that reason, political theory and um, political science, it's, it's strange because although you take this course within a political science, you know, it's, it has a political science designator and it's taught by somebody who has a PhD in political science, it's a really different thing that you're doing when you engage in political theory. Um, but again, and I can't stress this enough, this is not to say Right. When you see this focus on the ideal or focus on concepts and values, um, that's not to say that political theory is not concerned with the real world or it's somehow removed from reality. Um, it's simply that the emphasis in political theory is more on what we ought to be doing than describing what happens or why or what's going to happen. Okay. Um, the Great Conversation of Political Theory. Now, because political theory deals less with the empirical realm of politics and more with this normative realm, uh, it's probably the most unique subfield within political science, and it's also probably the oldest. Right? People began thinking about those sorts of normative questions and what should be done politically, basically at the onset of large-scale forms of political organization. As soon as we had societies, as soon as we had governments, people began to ask these questions. And so we can look at some of the earliest surviving writings in Western civilization. If we go back to ancient Greece, and we're going back a couple thousand years at that point, um, we're already seeing people grappling with things like justice or the ideal form of the state or the ideal form of the citizen, right? So we tend to say that political theory really begins in ancient Greece, um, roughly in the 6th century BC, and it particularly it explodes during what's called the Golden Age of Ancient Athens. Um, so this is an area in which, um, a kind of time period in which you have uh, thinkers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, they're uh, emerging at this time, and they're asking questions about the nature of the good life, uh, the proper organization of the city-state. At that point, they didn't have modern states, but they had cities that basically uh, were their societies. The nature of the just society, so they're grappling with justice, and the qualities that we associate with the just man, the just citizen, right? Um, and that's ultimately where we begin our investigation of political theory uh, in this first week as we read uh, the dialogues of Socrates and we, we read Plato's Republic, um, so we go back to that time period and start to read some of those early ideas about justice and politics. But that long history of political thought is why political theory is often referred to as a great conversation. In many ways, when we engage in political theory today, so when we begin to ask ourselves those normative questions, what should our political lives be? What is our role as a citizen? We're taking part in a conversation. And we're taking part in a conversation that has lasted centuries. And we're often asking the same questions. They've been asked by others before us. But many would say that there's something enduring. There's something lasting about political theory that sets it apart 
from other subfields of political science. So when you ask yourself, what is justice? Or what is the proper role of the state? And when you ask yourself, why should I obey? Which is a question that we face every day, right? We um, pull up to a stoplight and <clears throat> there's nobody coming on either side, but there's this law that we don't run a stoplight. We don't run a red light. We're asking ourselves, why should we obey? <clears throat> and that's a political question. So when you do that, you're embarking on this journey, which others have taken. And, um, you know, others have grappled with these same questions. And that's why what we do in here uh, and what we'll read in here, it's not just this kind of, although the texts are historical, the questions are contemporary. The questions are ongoing. The questions are questions that we face every day. And so it's not this kind of dusty antiquarian interest. It's really important for how we live our lives. It's a really important class. And the question of what we should do in politics is, is something that we face. And we need to ask ourselves that question. We need to have good answers for why we do certain things, why we believe certain things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> moving somewhat into some of the ideas addressed by Berlin, um, we can talk about political theory in contrast to something called social sciences positivism. Um, so much of the work currently being done within the study of politics, particularly political science that focus on empirical questions, uh, can, can trace its roots to something called social sciences positivism. This started in the 1940s and 1950s, and to really break it down, you know, very, very simply, introductory level explanation of what was happening, there was this hope that we would be able to study uh, social phenomena, so politics and societies, right? We would be able to study that in the same objective scientific way that um, a geologist studies rock formations or uh, a natural scientist studies um, climate change, for example, right? That we could utilize evidence, collect data, collect information, and we had... Um, the basis for a new scientific approach to study these questions and to study politics. And so we had new statistical methods. We had ways that we could collect data and then plug them into uh, computers, which were just emerging. Or we could um, collect uh, public opinion data using, using new sampling techniques. It's hard to think about this today uh, because public opinion is so ever-present in our in our lives, but we, we only really figured out how to do that in the late 1930s, early 1940s, to take a statistical sample and make um, a pretty good statement about the larger population. So to pull a thousand people and then make a statement about, you know, the United States as a whole. We really only figured out how to do that in the 1940s. Um, so all of these things are happening, and it gives people this, this idea that we have new tools at our disposal, and it really the proper way to investigate politics is to focus less on those normative questions and to zero in on empirical ones, to zero in on those questions in which we describe, we explain, we predict. Um, and the newfound emphasis on empirical questions is really driven by the belief that what really matters in politics is what we can see and what we can experience. Right? So that is authentic knowledge, according to social sciences positivism. And um, we're going to focus on political phenomena that we can measure, that we can observe, that we can quantitatively test, and less on what should exist, less on what ought to exist. Um, and so that focus on what we can actually experience, that shift towards empirical questions in the social sciences we call positivism. Now, that kind of introduces um, a, a, a conflict between facts and values. The most rigid positivists, the people who really thought that this was the way to study politics, are going to say that we need to delineate that empirical realm of facts and that normative realm of, value, uh, of values. And if we want to be good social scientists, we can't conflate our measurement and analysis of what is with that speculative realm of what ought to be. So ideally, um, social science should aspire to value neutrality in the same way that 
the hard sciences, the natural sciences, aspire to value neutrality. So we should study politics in the same way that we study, you know, in the same way that the geologist studies rocks. Uh, they don't think that there are good rocks and bad rocks, but they have this objective scientific view. Okay, and that uh, this is leading up to Berlin, right? This is the time period in which he was writing is after the rise of social sciences positivism, and that's the context in which he's writing this piece. And so he says, um, okay, so there's this normative conception that says we should think about politics and focus on judgment. And those who argue for that are kind of losing the battle at this point. They're losing for the battle for what political analysis should be. And so some are even saying political theory is dead. We have this new scientific paradigm, and we don't need to think about what ought to exist anymore. And that is the context in which he's writing his piece. Okay. So Berlin um, approaches this philosophically. And he starts off with the question of the demise of a discipline. Political science is a discipline. Right? Um, it's just an area of study, right? a field of study within the academy, within a university. And he says there's two reasons why a discipline could die. You know, demise means the end um, of a discipline. He says there's two reasons that academic disciplines or fields of study die out. And so if we're going to ask whether political theory is dead, then we have to think about whether or not either of those reasons uh, applies to political theory. So the first reason is that its central presuppositions, its basic assumptions, are no longer accepted. They've been withered away, they've been refuted, they've been destroyed by argument. So the basic assumptions that operate in political theory uh, no longer exist. The second reason is that perhaps a new discipline has come to perform the work originally undertaken in that older form of study. Right? So those are the reasons why a field of study would disappear or it would die. And uh, Berlin actually talks about the example of phrenology. Now for those of you that are not familiar with phrenology, uh, phrenology was very popular in the 19th century. It was a way of um, kind of predates uh, contemporary psychiatry or psychology, um, certainly predates contemporary, contemporary cognitive neuroscience, uh, and it was a way that um, a phrenologist would try to ascertain information about personality and the mood and um, an individual's mind by studying or reading the bumps on someone's skull. Right. So if you were to go to a phrenologist, they would start to kind of feel your skull and map out your skull. And they create this map. And um, basically, they just feel your head. And they try to look at the bumps and the fissures in your skull. And they had whole series of, um, a whole series of hypotheses about what certain bumps and what certain fissures and shapes within the formation of your skull meant uh, for your personality and your mood and your mind. And um, so they would make prescriptive recommendations on the basis of that, on the basis of your, the shape of your skull, right? Now today that probably sounds a little weird to us um, because it's recognized that figuring out the inner working of the mind is a little more complex and demanding than feeling bumps on someone's skull. So modern psychiatry and eventually uh, neuroscience have displaced phrenology and now it's, it's pretty much a joke. If you said, you know, someone was engaged in phrenology, you'd be saying that they have dubious scientific credentials or they're kind of a quack. Um, but that leads us to the question uh, that Berlin is asking in the early 1960s, which does either of those critiques, does either of those reasons why an academic discipline, a field of study, would die, does it apply to political theory? And so has normative questioning about politics become obsolete? Is political theory dead? Is um, you know asking questions that have an element of judgment within them, is that now obsolete? Um, Berlin's answer to that, um, hopefully you got a sense that his answer is no. Um, and it's also, you know, almost 50 years uh, 
actually exactly 50 years since Berlin wrote this, and you're enrolled in an intro political theory class, so hopefully the answer was no, but he says no, um, very emphatically. He says no, political theory is not dead. Um, and we still uh, teach political theory. People still have normative debates about politics, about what should exist. Um, so obviously political theory is still around. So he says it's central presuppositions. The idea that it is valuable to ask ourselves what should exist or what ought to exist with regard to politics, that still holds. We still believe that. Um, and nothing thus far has stepped in to work, do the work which political theory did previously. So political theory is not like um, phrenology. You know, it is not an aspect of um, our intellectual discourse that we consider antiquated or obsolete or useless. Uh, we still think it's important to ask, what is justice? Or what are the responsibilities of the citizen? And um, that's not an empirical question. That's a question which involves judgment. Um, and he also, he says, this particular assertion, the fact that we're asking this question right now is kind of absurd. And there's a very specific reason. And if you think back to the early 1960s, um, and you think back, you know, kind of the history of that time, what's going on at that point in time, there's a very clear reason why he thinks that question is absurd. And that is the Cold War, right? That is the battle between um, the United States and the Soviet Union, this kind of tension, hostility that drives so much of what is happening in the early 1960s. In 1963, we basically come to the brink of nuclear war with the Soviet Union, something which would have threatened the existence of life on Earth with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, that, Berlin says, is a normative battle, right? The Cold War is a normative battle. This is a standoff which threatens the entire world, and the heart of what is at stake is what type of political and economic form of organization ought to exist. It's a normative question. It's a normative debate. So in the West, it was democracy and capitalism. That was the answer. And in uh, the Soviet Union, it was a centralized one-party state with a socialist economy. And so arguably the most important question that faced the world in the early 1960s, the, the question which threatened to devolve into nuclear war and potentially destroy life on Earth, was a normative question. And yet here we are, Berlin says, and we're having a debate over uh, whether or not political theory is dead. It just shows, you know, in his mind, it shows a remarkable disconnect between uh, the types of debates that we're having and what's actually happening in the world. So he says, no, political theory is not dead. And he also says that political theory is <clears throat> unique in relation to empirical inquiry. Um, so not only does he say that political theory still exists, and it hasn't been replaced by this empirical scientific approach, a facts-based approach to political inquiry, but he says that can't happen um, because empirical methods of political analysis ask questions that can be answered via certain methods. Uh, we have observation and inference. We have formal logic. So if you think back to those empirical questions, um, let's say we want to ask a descriptive question, who participates in politics? Well, we have certain methods to answer that question, and if we had enough time, and we had enough energy, and we had pretty good data on who is participating in politics, we could answer that question pretty definitively. Right? So if we went back over the voter rolls in the 2012 election, and um, we measured how many people voted, and what different demographics voted, we could answer that question through, in that case, through uh, observation and the collection of data. And we could answer it pretty definitively. We could say, yeah, you know, this is, um, these are the groups which participated, and this is how much they participated. But political theory is different. It asks questions in which there's no universally accepted answer. And there's not even a single method by which we would arrive at one, right? So asking a question like, why do we obey our government? is a very different question than who participated in the 2012 election. Why do we obey our government? There's not going to be any universal consensus 
and there's really no means by which we could arrive at one. Um, there was another political and social theorist, and he said that political theory deals with essentially contested questions. Their very essence is that they could not be answered definitively. Um, what is justice, right? We could sit down for an entire semester and ask ourselves, what is justice? Uh, what does it mean to have a just society? And chances are at the end of that semester, we might have reached some points of agreement and we might have some general framework, but we're going to have deep, deep disagreement with regard to the specifics of what justice is. And that's just the nature of humanity. We're never going to completely agree on these types of questions, questions that involve normative judgment. So Berlin is making the case that um, there can never be universal consensus here. We can never have a definitive answer. And so empirical inquiry can never displace uh, normative questioning. Right? It's a very powerful argument he makes. Because of that, right, for that very reason, because there is no single answer to the normative questions of political theory, and because there's always going to need to be a scope for human judgment, Berlin is a tireless advocate of the importance of liberty and the expression of ideas and opinions. And he calls this pluralism. Um, he states in another work of his, this is another essay, and you didn't read this, um, but this is a, an extended quote from Berlin that I'll just read to you. He says, The notion that there must exist final objective answers to normative questions, truths that can be demonstrated or are directly intuited, that it is in principle possible to discover a harmonious pattern in which all values are reconciled, and that it is towards this unique goal that we must strive, that we can uncover some single central principle that shapes this vision, a principle which once found will govern our lives, this ancient and almost universal belief on which so much traditional thought and action and philosophical doctrine rest seems to me invalid, and at times to have led, and still to lead, to absurdities in theory and barbarous consequences in practice. Right. So when we get into the normative realm, when we get into the realm of judgment, when we start to act as if we have a single answer, that is when we see absurdities in theory and barbarous consequences in practice. That is when we see the absolute worst instances in humanity, in the history of human existence, is when we begin to act as if we have single definitive answers for questions to which there are no answers. Right? For him, politics is about pluralism. Politics is about the impossibility of a single answer and the idea that societies, because there's no single answer, societies have to provide space for as many different ideas, as many different identities, as many different positions, as many different political perspectives as we possibly can. Right? That is what pluralism is, is diversity and diversity in respect to core political identities and core political questions. And he juxtaposes that to monism, right? So if you think of um, plural, right? Plural means many, and monism means one. And monism would be the belief in a single universal truth, a single ideology. And he says that that idea he believes is invalid, and it leads to not only absurdity, so it's kind of silly, but in practice, when we actually put it into practice, when we base entire political systems around the idea of a single answer, or we base um, systems of justice around a single set of ideas, and we don't allow room for diversity, then we see barbarous consequences. And the examples that, that he cites, or we could cite, um, would be many of the things that we know as you know, some, of, some pretty hideous um, human experiences. Um, the Christian theologians of the Middle Ages, if you read their work, we don't read any other work in here, but they believe strongly that there is one truth and there is, uh, that is God's truth, the Christian God. And so we could think about the Crusades as an example of this, right? As an example of this um, 
this idea. Uh, the ancient Greeks, they um, some of the most influential thinkers among the ancient Greeks believed in the idea of an ideal form or concept. Um, there's an ideal form of justice. There's an ideal you know form of the citizen. And so they believed in um, in a form of monism, right? That we can find some universal truth. But once you move more recently, you see um, really frightening things. Uh, so Soviet-style communism, right? Um, which was responsible for the death of at least 20 million people, possibly far more. Um, that was based around the idea of a single truth. That was based around the idea of a class-based revolution and the rule of a strong centralized state that was supposed to liberate the working classes and ultimately it enslaved them. Um, ultimately, it was, uh, you know, millions of people died, millions of people were oppressed, lots of people were um put in, in political prisons. There was an entire network of surveillance. Um, European fascism would be another example. Right? You're all, I'm sure, on some level or another, you're familiar with the, the Nazis, right, and the rise of the Nazis, but that was the universal truth of a racial hierarchy and the superior superiority and supremacy of the quote-unquote Aryan race. And um, that led to pretty hideous consequences and led to just massive, massive repression and um, genocidal atrocities for a period of about, you know, 10, 15 years in Europe. Um, so for Berlin, Berlin, there's no single truth. All that we can really count on in political life is debate and the need for uh, thoughtful exchange and in many cases, compromise and negotiation between um, fundamentally competing worldviews, right? That is the modern condition. That is the human condition, is that we're never going to agree about normative questions. We're never going to agree about questions which have an element of judgment. And, um, and many would argue that in the contemporary United States, uh, maybe this is something we've lost. This commitment to pluralism, which always defined our society, um, perhaps we're too prone to thinking that our view is the right view, that our view is capital T truth. And so perhaps, perhaps we're too quick to see compromise, to see negotiation, to see intellectual exchange as selling out our ideals, as failure, as weakness, right? Um, so, uh, not Berlin, he really sees pluralism as necessary and he thinks that, uh, if we don't have pluralism, then, um, not only is our view invalid, but it puts us in a very, very dangerous place that, uh, can lead to really kind of barbarous political practice. So to close out, uh, today's lecture and having laid out political theory in relationship to political science, um, what I'd like to do in the first lecture is to lay out the three really important roles that political theory can play in relation to political science. So what is the role of normative questioning in relation to empirical questioning? Right? Um, we've talked a lot about how political theory is unique because of the types of questions it asks, but ultimately we have to bring it back to uh, empirical questioning and how did the two interrelate. And um, I would argue that there are, there are three really important roles that political theory plays in relation to political science and in relation to just understanding politics. If you're going to understand American politics or international politics, um, you need to have this kind of base. Otherwise, your understanding of politics is going to be impoverished. So this is a fundamental foundational course as far as I'm concerned. So the first is conceptual, right? Political theory is the realm of this discipline in which we define our most fundamental concepts. So if we're going to study democracy, and plenty of people do study democracy. Um, first, we have to, before we go out and we try and measure democracy, or we try and think about how democratic a regime is, we need to talk about what democracy conceptually is. What does it mean to say a country is democratic, or more democratic, or less democratic than another country? Um, and that applies also to our responsibilities as citizens. If we're going to think about what it means to be a democratic citizen, we have to have some sort of conceptual understanding of democracy. And too often we don't ask that question, right? we don't think about that. 
Um, so this is an area in which we lay out kind of the conceptual architecture, not only of our study of politics, but also our political lives. Right? Uh, another example is legitimacy, you know, an important concept. Um, we say that Barack Obama or you know, the United States um, Congress has a certain level of legitimacy. Well, what does that mean to say that they possess um, legitimacy and to say that some dictator like Robert Mugabe, right, um, he's the current ruler of Zimbabwe and he's not by any stretch of the imagination a Democrat. Um, well, what does it mean to say that you know, Barack Obama has more legitimacy than, um, than a third world dictator, right? Um, that requires us first to think at a very abstract and very theoretical level about what it means when we use that term. So we have to define the concept. And political theory is where we tend to define those concepts. We tend to really devote a lot of attention to what do these things mean? What do these concepts mean? Um, what does it mean to say that something is democratic? So that's a very important role, right? And that's the first role that I think political theory plays in relationship to political science. Um, second is historical. Uh, political theory is the realm of this discipline in which we explore the history of ideas. We talk about what influential figures wrote and spoke, and also the impact that we had, um, that political theory had on political outcomes, right? So um, one of the defining features of the 20th century was revolutionary upheaval, upheaval and um, the rise of communist and, and socialist ideas. Right? So in, um, in Russia, but eventually in Latin America and Southeast Asia and Africa and elsewhere, there was this rise of um, socialist or communist ideology. And this was consequential, right? The Cold War that I mentioned earlier, that happened because of this. Um, the war that the United States fought in Vietnam was based on the rise of um, socialism and, and communism in Southeast Asia and the fear that it would spread. Um, but in order to understand that, in order to understand that revolutionary upheaval and the appeal of those ideas, you have to go back to uh, the writings of really Karl Marx, which we do in this class. We read Marx. If you're going to understand why socialism had such broad appeal, you have to go back to the, the core ideas of socialism. Any political movement, any revolution, starts as a set of ideas. And that is really the starting point for socialism and communism. Right? So there are those that study something called the history of political thought, and that's what they do. They study the relationship between historical writings and the role that they play in shaping human history, and that relationship can be profound. It can be pretty significant. And then lastly, um, there's the programmatic role. Political theory is the realm of political science in which we articulate a political program. We develop a concrete conception of what the world we desire ought to look like and why. And that really can't be done strictly through empirics. You can't simply ask empirical questions and, um, and develop a program of what you want the world to look like. It can't simply be done by explaining or describing or predicting. Because at some initial point, you would need to articulate a vision of what the world should look like and why. So maybe once you develop a program, once you develop kind of a conception of what politics in the United States ought to look like, then you can go back and you can ask empirical questions. You can compare the ideal that you've established versus the reality. And you can think about how uh, existing society would need to change in order to reach that ideal. But at the outset, you need to articulate that vision of what the world should look like and why. And political theory is the realm of political science that, um, you know, does that. That's where, this is where we ask the difficult normative questions about what is democracy or what is justice. So um, those are the three roles that I think political theory plays in relationship to political science. And it's, it's one of the reasons why it's such an important and such a foundational course. It's really important that... Um, we uh, systematically attend to those questions before we go off and we study um, political phenomena or we begin to act in the world as, as citizens um, without attending to some of the, the judgment normative-based questions that really ground that. Okay. 
Um, so, as I laid out in the initial lecture, um, the idea is that you'll do the reading, you'll watch the lecture, which you've just done, and then I have um, these uh, videos, which uh, short video clips that uh, kind of take some of the abstract ideas that we discuss in lecture, and they bring them into focus on uh, in relation to a contemporary issue or a contemporary question. Um, today's video is actually, it's a few years old, uh, but I think it, it still applies. Um, it's a, a brief clip, and it's an author talking about um, Barack Obama and his commitment to bipartisanship. And I think originally this was... Um, while the debate over the Affordable Care Act, or what's been called Obamacare, right, while that was raging. And um, Obama was facing a lot of criticism for his commitment to bipartisanship, right, his, at least the, the rhetoric that he would employ, that he wanted to ensure that there was bipartisanship. And um, bipartisanship is still, that's an ongoing issue uh, in the United States. A lot of people bemoan the fact that um, politics has become so partisan, and there's very few instances in which Democrats and Republicans will work together uh, on policy, particularly once we get to the national level. You know, the, the Congress right now, um, particularly the House of Representatives, is really deeply divided, and it's very, very hard to get anything done uh, when there's such uh, tension and such hostility between the two parties. And so in the discussion board, so watch that clip. Uh, it's really short, just a couple minutes. And um, in the discussion board, I want you to think about the contemporary debates over bipartisanship in relation to um, Berlin's view on pluralism. I think there's um, a certain um, resonance there. I think that what Berlin has to say about pluralism uh, can also shape our thinking today about um, bipartisanship and the need for bipartisanship and maybe the dangers of partisanship. Um, so I'll have an introductory post over there, but then you're kind of free to explore whatever ideas or um, whatever opinions uh, you want to share in there. Um, and I, I think that that could be a very interesting discussion. Um, the next lecture, for our next lecture, uh, you're reading two uh, relatively short but very influential pieces by um, Plato. Plato, in much of his work, he documents... Um, Socrates. Socrates never wrote anything, um, but Plato uh, kind of presents the life of Socrates and the ideas of Socrates. Um, so I'll provide more of a more of an introduction uh, in the next lecture. But these are two core works of Western political philosophy, and they're going back uh, quite some time. Uh, the Defense of Socrates and uh, the Crito are written thousands of years ago, um, and uh, in the defense, the, what's specifically happening is Socrates is on trial for his life. Um, he's offering a very defiant defense for his crime, which uh, his crime, what he's charged with, is essentially engaging in philosophy. Uh, the Crito is kind of like a sequel. It picks up a little bit later. Socrates is in prison, and he's contemplating escape, and he's weighing his um, ability to escape against his reverence for the laws of Athens and his commitment to justice. So um, that's where we're going to pick up next time. Again, these are some challenging pieces, so do consult the reading questions if you have any questions and um, or to kind of focus your reading. And uh, that's where we'll start in next time in Lecture 2. I'll see you there.